Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so we're in a series in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, today's passage is particularly important because it marks a, a turning point in the story of Jesus according to Mark. Uh, the story we're going to look at today opens Act 2 in the story of Jesus. Act 1 describes Jesus' uh, ministry in the region of Galilee. Act 2 describes Jesus' uh, journey together with his disciples to Jerusalem. And during this journey, Peter makes this astonishing confession that you are the Christ. And Jesus admits to it. And Jesus begins to teach his disciples about the things that he must encounter when he arrives in Jerusalem. And also the things that his disciples must expect to do if they are to remain his followers. So today's passage can be found in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Mark 8, 27 to 38. And Jesus uh, went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The whole point of emphasis in today's sermon is going to be the cross. And I think it's appropriate to talk about the cross because it's almost Easter. So we have today, we have next Sunday, and the following Sunday will be Easter Sunday. And in this, in this passage, the cross is presented in two ways. One way the cross is presented is it's presented as something that Jesus must go through for us in order to save us. But the other way it's presented is it's presented as a model for how we, if we say that we are Christians, how we are to live our lives on this earth. So again, the cross is both a place Jesus atones for people's sins, but at the same time, it's an approach that we who call ourselves Christians are to take towards living our life on this earth. We live our lives in the shadow of the cross. Our lives are to reflect what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Now, I'm not getting this out of thin air. This, is, this isn't coming out of my imagination. I'm pulling these ideas from this passage. Where does this passage talk about the cross as being a sacrifice that atones for sins? Well, I see it when Jesus says that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be killed. And where does it talk about the cross as being a model for how we are to live our lives if we call ourselves Christians? Well, I see this when Jesus says in verse 34, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So we're going to 
talk about both views of the cross today. So first, let's talk about the cross as it's presented in the first way, as an atoning sacrifice. When Jesus says he must suffer all things, many things, he's saying that all along, from the time that he was born till now, the divine plan has been for him to die on the cross. He's not a victim of unjust systems or unjust people. What happened, happened according to God's plan. And his death was not a failure of God's agenda, but rather the fulfillment of God's agenda. And though people acted according to their free will and did what seemed right to them at the time in killing Jesus, that in fact behind the scene it was God who was orchestrating the events so that everything that happened happened according to his plan and foreknowledge. So people ac acted according to their free will, but God predestined everything to happen the way it did. Now, I know this brings up all kinds of moral, logical, and philosophical questions, such as, how can God hold people who did this thing to Jesus accountable for what they did when God predestined everything to happen the way it did? And how can God predestine everything if people have genuine free will? Now, I don't confess to know how it all works out. I'm not God. But without going too far into this, because this is a sermon about the cross rather than a sermon about predestination or free will, I will say that the Bible teaches the reality of both. The Bible teaches the reality of free will and the reality of predestination. Both are operative in our lives. So according to scripture, there's no contradiction in saying that we are free to choose, yet God predestines everything according to his purpose and foreknowledge. And I can't figure this out, but it's because I'm a little underqualified for the job of figuring it out. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? I'm going to reserve that topic for another sermon. Okay? For now, let's talk about the cross. So it says the Son of Man must suffer. And the question I want to ask is, in what sense did Jesus feel that he must suffer? In what way did he feel that he has to suffer? In what way must the Son of Man suffer? And the answer that the Bible gives is, is without the cross, we cannot receive God's forgiveness. So the idea is that Jesus' suffering is necessary for our forgiveness, for the redemption of our souls. Now I know this also raises questions like, why can't God just forgive? That's the question that my daughter often asks me. <laughs> okay, she's saying, no, don't talk about me. <laughs> well, she's asked me this question uh, a number of times. She might even have asked some of you. Why is Jesus' suffering even necessary? Right? It's a good question. It's an interesting question. Right? It means that she's smart. Right? She's thinking about these things, and that's what we need to do. Right? We can't just accept things wholesale without questioning things. So she's doing that. So that's a good thing. Okay? So don't worry. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Now this question, I think, shows an underestimation of the sinfulness of sin and the holiness of God. It underestimates the sinfulness of sin and the holiness of God. And here's what I mean. To say to somebody, why don't you just forgive? Why are you still angry? Why don't you just forgive? Right? You can only say that if you think that the wrong that you did to that person is no big deal. Right? It's no big deal. Why are you making a big deal out of it? But if you understand, if you feel how deeply offensive the wrong that you did was, you wouldn't ask the person you just wronged just to forgive. Because you know how hard it is to forgive somebody who wronged you, mistreated you, cheated you, rejected you. If somebody has done something to hurt you or wound you, you know how hard it is to forgive. You know from first-hand experience how hard it is to forgive. 
Because to forgive that person, you would, in a sense, be absorbing the evil that that person has done to you, right? So, for example, if somebody has cheated you out of some money, to forgive that person, you would, in a sense, be absorbing the financial loss that he caused you. You would have to absorb that loss. You would have to eat it. So if you choose to forgive, you are in a sense absorbing the evil done to you. And instead of making that person pay, you are paying for that person's sins. But that's exactly what the gospel says that Jesus has done for us. Instead of God making us pay for our sins, he paid for our sins on the cross. So he says he must go to the cross because not to go to the cross would mean our damnation, our separation, our alienation from God, our broken relationship, our punishment, our hell. But he wasn't willing that anyone should perish, so he perished for us. Now that's one thing the cross means. It's an instrument of our redemption. It's a satisfaction of all of our debts to God. But as I told you before, the cross doesn't just mean that. It's also a model for how we, who are Christians, are to live the rest of our lives here on earth. So when Jesus says to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me, what is Jesus telling them? Is Jesus telling them that when he goes to Golgotha to be crucified, that he expects his disciples to be crucified along with him? No, of course not. What Mark is describing is more a way of living than a way of dying, right? You know the way that cross-bearing is commonly understood in our society? The way that we understand it, the way that we think it means is accepting an unpleasant situation without complaining too much because you can't really do anything about it. Right? That's a common understanding of what taking up the cross means. So, for example, if you have a health problem, okay, you might think, well, that's, you know, that's my cross to bear. Or your, your, your mother-in-law is in town, and you don't like her, but you have to be nice to her for the sake of your marriage. And that's just one of the crosses you have to bear in your marriage. But is this what Jesus is talking about? No, no. It's not being stoic in our difficulties. It's not enduring hardship without complaint does Jesus mean when he says, take up the cross and follow me? Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So what Bonhoeffer is saying is that Jesus' call to take up our cross and follow him is a call to abandon our desires and attachments to this world, to participate in Jesus' suffering and death through our own sacrificial living and giving, to give ourselves daily over to the death of our ego, the death of our pride, the death of our worldly ambitions, the death of our very selves for the sake of Christ. And why should we do this? Why should we do this thing that is so unnatural to us? Because it's through losing ourselves that we can find ourselves. Do you ever feel sometimes that you are so full of yourself? I do. I'm so concerned about my worries, my problems, my agenda, my reputation, how I'm being perceived, how other people are thinking about me, how other people are perceiving me. Right? It's me, it's me, miserable me. And I don't think I'm the only one. A lot of people are like this. And I think a lot of us want to be, or at least recognize the need to be, less self-absorbed, less self-centered, because we see that it's making us miserable. Thinking too much about ourselves makes us miserable. It gives us a lot of bad things, such as anxiety and depression. But it's hard to break out of this cycle of self-absorption, self-pity, self-concern, and just being wrapped up in ourselves. 
So what am I supposed to do? Am I just supposed to tell myself, you know, stop thinking about yourself? Stop being so concerned about yourself? Telling myself those things won't work. It won't help me. Just stop, the, stop thinking about yourself. It, it won't work. It doesn't work. I can't unwrap myself of my concerns just by talking to myself. So what should I do? What should I do? And the answer that the Bible gives, the answer that Jesus gives in this passage, is the way that you do this is by losing yourself in service to me, in worship of me. So that the thing that dominates your life is not you, but me. So that the central motivation for everything you do is not for you to get ahead, but for me to be glorified. So that your greatest satisfaction in this world is not you, the applause of other people, the increase of your reputation and status, but knowing me, serving me, worshiping me. Let me give you an example of how this might work out in your life. And I'm going to use myself as an example. I usually don't talk about myself that much, but today <laughs> I'm going to talk about myself. A couple of weeks ago, I was in class. And my professor, um, the lecturer, said something about Saul. Do you remember Saul, King Saul? He was the first king of Israel. And what he said wasn't anything particularly profound or interesting or remarkable, but it caught my attention. He said something to the effect that God selected him to be king over Israel um, even though he was small in his own eyes. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about this. He was paraphrasing that verse. Now that statement, even though it wasn't remarkable, it made an impact on my heart. I mean, it hit me personally because I have been feeling small in my own eyes. That's my confession to you. Now you might not think that's even a problem. I mean, what's the problem with that? What's the matter with being small in your eyes? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a sign of being humble? Isn't being small in your eyes mean, doesn't that mean being humble? No. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Being small in your eyes is a sign that you're proud. And here's what I mean. If you're small, in your eyes, you feel that way because you're comparing yourself with others. And comparing yourself with others comes from competitiveness, which is a sign of pride. Your sense of smallness is a result of you proudly comparing yourself with other people. For example, when my wife... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's looking down. Oh, no. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to talk about her now. <laughs> when my wife is in Canada, she feels small, right? Because there's a lot of people around her that's taller than her. But when she um, and I were visiting Japan, she didn't feel small because there were a lot of people who were smaller than her. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not that small. Right? But when Jimmy was around, and I was standing next to him, or he was standing next to me, I felt tiny. Right? I felt like a little schoolboy. Now, those are silly examples, but the principle is still true. Right? A feeling of smallness results from you comparing yourself with other people who are of the same scale, but bigger than you. But when you're comparing yourself with something that is of a totally different scale, do you feel small? For example, when you look at the stars and you think about how big, how, how immense the universe is, or let's say you're worried about something that you have to do tomorrow, and when you think about tomorrow, you feel worried, but when you think about one million years from now, 
Do you feel worried? No, you think that's insignificant, right? That's nothing to be concerned about. When you put something up against something of the same scale but bigger, it might look small. But when you put something up against something that is of a totally different scale, like infinity, it doesn't feel small, it feels insignificant. And as I was thinking about this um, in class, instead of listening to the lecture, I was reminded of Isaiah the prophet and how he felt. Do you remember at the beginning of chapter 6 of Isaiah, it's recorded that Isaiah was in the temple and he had a vision of the Lord on his throne high and lifted up. And because of that vision, Isaiah didn't just see himself as being a small thing, he saw himself as being a nothing, a nobody. He said, woe is me, I am lost. He was lost in a vision of God that caused him to lose sight of himself. He didn't just see himself as small. He saw himself as being an, an infinitely small speck of dust in the universe of God's holiness and glory. It caused him to take his eyes off himself completely because he saw the Lord. And that's what we need. That's how we stop being so self-absorbed. How are we going to get this vision that enables us to lose sight of ourselves? Well, for Isaiah, who lived on the other side of the cross, it was a vision of the Lord on his throne, high and lifted up, but for us who live on this side of the cross, it is a vision of our Lord on the cross, dying for our sins. The cross and the legacy of the cross, which we call the gospel, should so dominate our vision of life that it fills our entire frame of view. Do you understand that? So that everything, including ourselves, fades and disappears from our sight. You know, the Bible calls us to do many difficult things. The Bible tells us that we should forgive others of the debt that they committed against us. But how are we going to do that? When somebody has done something to us that has so hurt us, how are we going to do that? By looking to the cross. The Bible tells us that we should love one another in love. I mean, we should serve one another in love, but how are we going to sacrificially serve one another, losing, letting go of our self-interest by looking to the cross? The Bible says, be not angry. But how are we going to let go of our self-centered anger when somebody has offended us, has dishonored us by looking to the cross? When the glory of the cross fills our entire frame of view so that there's not, nothing that we see except Jesus and Him crucified, then there's a lot of difficult things in the Bible that we can actually start doing. On the cross, God revealed Himself to be a God who is willing to make Himself nothing to serve rather than to be served, to be tortured and killed for our sake. And when we see the scale of His love and the scale of His mercy and grace towards us, then we begin to lose ourselves. And by losing ourselves, save ourselves. See, this is the key to living the Christian life. This is the key to obedience. It's not kind of bending our will to the will of God, is actually melting our hearts to conform to the will of God. Now let's look at Peter's response to this. How did Peter respond to what Jesus was telling him about what awaited him in Jerusalem? Well, Peter rebuked Jesus. I know this isn't exactly what Peter said. It's not what 
what's in scripture. But Peter said something, probably something to the effect that, you know, the Messiah doesn't die on a cross. The Messiah triumphs over his enemy. What are you talking about, Jesus? Do you know what, what the Messiah is? Are you the Messiah? I can imagine Peter shaking his head at Jesus. No, you don't, you don't get it, Jesus. And I think we can say from Peter's response that Peter had what Martin Luther called the theology of glory. What's that? A theology of glory. That's, um, well, let me try to explain this by um, explaining explaining how Carl Truman, who's a, a church historian and theologian, described it. He said, the theologians of glory are those who build their theology in the light of what they expect God to be like. Again, theologians of glory are those who build their theology in the light of what they expect God to be like. Now, the problem of doing this, the problem of building theology in the light of what we expect God to be like, is that we tend to make God in our own image. Right? We tend to make God look a lot like us. So we expect God to be strong. We expect God to be powerful. And there's nothing theologically wrong in saying God is strong and powerful, but the problem comes in what we mean by power. What's power? Well, we know what power is. Right? Power means being on top. It means having influence. It means exercising control. It means getting what you want. That's power. But in the light of the cross, our idea of power is shown to be utter foolishness. The cross shows God's power, but God's power is none of the above. The cross shows God's power is not what we expect power to be. So the question that I have is, how was God's power manifested in the cross? And the answer is through weakness. If you're a Christian, you believe that the cross was a display of God's power because he defeated sin and death on the cross. But how did he defeat sin and death on the cross? Through weakness and suffering. God's power is revealed in weakness. And as, you know, I can go on. I can point out that God's wisdom is revealed in his foolishness. You know, smart people don't climb down. They climb up. Smart people don't give up their position for others. They use their position for their advantage. But such wisdom is foolishness to God. And God's wisdom is foolishness to other people. And Peter, and people like Peter, who operate from a theology of glory, have no room in their theology for suffering and failure. But what we need is what Luther called a theology of the cross. And this is a theology that simply will not call weakness and suffering evil. Think about it. If we truly believe that weakness and suffering is bad, is evil, we would be forced to say that the suffering of Jesus on the cross was evil and bad. But then the question becomes, in what sense is suffering not evil? In what sense can suffering be good? When the sense that God works all things, including suffering, together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Well, what I'm saying is that we can't have a simple attitude towards suffering and say suffering is evil. Suffering can be good. Because what the cross shows is that suffering is not only a consequence of sin, but it's also a way to be liberated from sin. What does the writer of Hebrews say? that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. 
And God can use all things, including Jesus' suffering, including our suffering, together for the good of those who love him. If we let him. And this should give us a new complex perspective on suffering in all of its various forms. Suffering in relation to our marriage, suffering in relation to our health, suffering in relation to our job, suffering in relation to our finance. If you're suffering, you can't say that that suffering is bad or evil. You can't say it from, the, from this biblical point of view. You can't say it if you see Jesus on the cross suffering. Because suffering can be used for our good. Suffering can be used to make us more like Jesus. And that brings me to today's application. I want to apply everything that we learned today in this way. The, pro the cross gives us an inner freedom to fail. The cross gives us an inner freedom to fail because failure is not necessarily the end of the world. And because our work or school is not necessarily a life and death struggle anymore. We can have an inner freedom to fail. We can have an inner freedom to get a C plus instead of an A. We can have an inner freedom for people to think, well, he tried very hard. I can see that he's trying very hard, but he's not doing a very good job. Because whether I do a good job according to others or a bad job according to others, whether I'm successful or a failure, it doesn't shatter my identity. I might feel bad for a while if people say that. But it doesn't make me question who I am. Because I know who I am in Christ. Now that doesn't mean that we can take every day off and not work hard. But that does mean that we have a totally different motivation for working hard. We won't work hard to prove ourselves. We won't work hard to gain an, ident an ident identity because we already have an identity in Christ. We know that God loves us. Whether we succeed or fail, then all we need to do is just try our best. And this has to be one of the greatest comforts that the gospel gives us. The freedom to fail. The ability to smile and say that the worst that can ever happen is that I will fail. And this is the core of our faith. This is what makes us Christian. Not the behavior, but the inner freedom that the Spirit of the Lord gives us. Do you understand that? The freedom from our old self. The freedom from anxiety, the freedom from fear, the freedom not to sin, the freedom to stop working, the freedom to rest. Don't you want that? I mean, we can get it. We can get it by taking a hold of Christ. But if we take a hold of Christ, we have to let go of whatever is in our hand. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for um, the cross, and I thank you for what the cross represents, um, our forgiveness, our redemption, your love for us, um, your love for us that is so great that you would send your only son, one and only son, to die on the cross of suffering and shame for our sins. May that reality of um, your love, your acceptance, uh, so fill our hearts, so um, delight our hearts that we are able to let go of all of our disappointments, all of our anxieties, all of our worries, all of our self-concern. May that uh, motivate us to serve you, love you, be obedient to you. Help us to get this, Father. So we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.